Well, good afternoon. My name is Logan McCoy, and I'm the Vice President of Services for CTB Technology. Today, we're going to be talking about Microsoft Solution, specifically referring to Office 365. Now, before we go ahead and jump into it, just as a quick point of reference, every attendee should actually have been muted as you enter this session. So if you have a question, please feel free to enter that into the Q&A session on the bottom right. What I'll then be doing at the very end of this time is taking a few of those questions and answering them as best as I can. Any questions that we can't get to or through, I'll be sure to follow up with you on personally to make sure we get you those answers. So with that, let's jump right into it. Just a little quick agenda today so that you have an idea of what we're going to be talking about. First, I want to give you a very quick overview about CCB, what we are and what we do. Then I want to talk actually more generally about why people are moving to the cloud. Next, I want to move into a general overview of what is Microsoft's Office 365 solution. Then I want to actually talk a little bit more specifically about the Office 365 plans and pricing available to you as a client today. And last, but certainly not least, I actually want to demo the Office 365 solution. And really today, so you have a good idea of what we're looking to do is, if you're not really sure what Office 365 is, if you're maybe running the trial and you have a general sense, but not really what it can do and how it might benefit your organization, this is really the webinar for you. And, and this is uh, hopefully the agenda that will get you that good information to get you to go where you need to be. Just a little bit first about CCB technology. We were started back in 1991, and we were started really with the heart mission to serve the nonprofit community. Since then, and being business now for over 25 years, we've actually expanded our offerings to no longer just working with the nonprofit community, but now also working with corporate and academic, healthcare, and government. And we've been a Microsoft partner since our inception. And so you can see here on the bottom left, we've won a number of different Microsoft awards, whether it was a general manager's award for the entire central region, beating out 5,000 different Microsoft partners, whether it was winning that as well in the East region, or actually being a cloud partner of the year. So time and time and again, we've continued to prove our excellence with Microsoft as being one of the top partners in the nation. And this specifically relates to Microsoft Office 365. We were one of the very first to actually really partner with Microsoft to help deploy Office 365 to our client base. And we've actually been able to deploy over, or I think at this point in time, it's now over 70,000 seats that we've helped deploy of Microsoft's Office 365 solution. So we do much more than that, but as it relates today, as you kind of know who we are as CCB technology, we definitely have a lot of breadth and expertise when it comes to varying cloud solutions, notwithstanding Microsoft's Office 365 solution. So a little bit more about why people are moving, because really at the end of the day, if this isn't helping to answer for you some critical business challenges and needs, then why move? And so I just very quickly want to run over about four different benefits that we are seeing of why clients are moving, I would say, at a fairly quickly pace now into varying cloud platform solutions, including Office 365. And the first is really around predictable and manageable costs. And this really kind of comes from the fact that when you look at a number of polls out there, 82% um, of all companies have stated that they saved money in their last cloud adoption. And of that, 32% are seeing a 50% ROI since moving to the cloud. And a major reason for this, when you look at it, is there's a number of things that you're actually saving money on. So you might be saving money from a software perspective, equipment, installation, server upgrades, break fix, maintenance, electricity and cooling, so on and so forth, is, is really where you're able to save a lot. But it's not just necessarily even about saving, it's now also being able to have predictable and manageable costs. Because one of the benefits of a subscription-based model is you're, you're, effect, you're, you're able to effectively manage those costs going forward because you know what that's going to be on a monthly basis. So gone are the days of, of trying to have to guess if I think a server is going to cost 15000 but I don't really know. I'm going to have to dive into that a little bit further. It's going to be a big pop this year, but I don't know what that really means for the budget next year. Really, this seeks to address one of those things where those costs oftentimes were kind of guesswork initially until you really dove into it. Whereas now, once you get up and running, it's very predictable and very manageable. And another one is flexibility and productivity. And this is absolutely critical because in our day and age, we have a number of customers who they're, they're moving a lot of their employees to a remote type environment, right? They're, they're allowing their employees to work from home or their employees are traveling more. And so because they, they have this flexible and dynamic type environment, they nonetheless have to enable their users to remain productive. So their users have to be able to access the documents that are critical to them in the field just as they would if they were in the office. 
And so a number of our clients are saying that some of the biggest benefits they're seeing from a cloud-based solution is the ability to enable users to work just as productively out of the office as if they were in the office. But with that as well, one of the biggest things that comes along and, and that we often deal with when we're talking with our clients about cloud-based solutions is really how secure is it? How reliable is it? And the biggest thing that, that we really kind of come to in all of that regard is that, well, at least for Microsoft's Office 365 solution, it meets many industry standards and compliances. So they have built-in email encryption, e email archive. They have in-place e-discovery. They have built-in retention policies and data loss prevention for things that are going to relate to HIPAA and PCI, FISMA, FERPA, so on and so forth, right? Microsoft is willing to actually sign a BAA. So if you're a healthcare organization, they're willing to sign that basically carte blanche to just say, we will, we will ensure what we need to based within this agreement, right? On top of that as well, Microsoft has done a phenomenal job in securing their data centers, both from a physical and a virtual perspective. And if you're interested about that, you can actually easily go to Bing or Google, whatever your preference is, and type in Microsoft Trust Center and they give you some phenomenal information in there regarding the steps that Microsoft takes to ensure that their data centers housing your data are secure and reliable. And last but not least, really one of the big reasons why people are moving is because it gives you the ability to allocate your resources. And a lot of times people say, well, that's a very general statement. And, and the thing that I like to focus on first and foremost is really IT is becoming absolutely critical to the overall health and I would say growth of an organization. So oftentimes the initiatives that we see the clients that we're working with taking involve some level of IT. It could be something with a website, it could be something from data analytics that will make them more competitive or give them the right information to actually uh, be, I would say, pointed in what they're actually trying to target from a market perspective. But oftentimes what we're still seeing is that a lot of the clients we work with, their IT people are, are yes, they're responsible for managing the day-to-day, -day, but that's all they're responsible for. Whereas in a lot of cases, a lot of the successful clients that we see, they're utilizing this from the day-to-day -day perspective, but also they're enabling their IT teams to be more strategic, to get into those, I would really say, business objectives to help accomplish the company goal, not just simply to keep the lights up and running. And so the ability to allocate resources, I would say from a human capital perspective, is absolutely huge. But then as well, from a financial perspective, as well from a technical perspective, they all really play into, again, why we see people moving to the cloud. Now, referring specifically to Microsoft Office 365, when I talk to clients and I say, so tell me, what does Office 365 mean to you? Oftentimes they'll come and say, well, I'm assuming it just means something to the effect of Office, right? And it's a subscription and I can access it through the cloud. And I say, you're spot on. That is definitely a critical component of the Office 365 stack. And as of right now, Office 2016 is the most recent availability from an application perspective. But then what I oftentimes want to educate my clients on is that it doesn't just include Office. It really, I would say, kind of stands on four main pillars. So Office being one of them, and that's in the name, is, is one of those key pillars. But the next one is Exchange, or email. Now, for those of you that aren't necessarily technical, Exchange is that back-end server application that really enables your, uh, your organization to effectively utilize email, right? So how, as an end-user perspective, you know that as Outlook, your Exchange admin or your network admin, they know that from a server application perspective as Exchange. And so that actually takes your on-prem or in-house Exchange server that you oftentimes had to buy hardware for, buy the licensing for, and it also throws it right into the Office 365 stack. With that as well, SharePoint. Now, at its most basic level, SharePoint is a document repository type application. So think of it as like a file server, right, where internally here at CCB we used to have something called the H drive. So we would store our sales and our marketing, our service documents, so on and so forth, right? And so at its basic level, that's what SharePoint is in the cloud. Where it takes it one step further is that beyond just actually storing the data there, it now enables you to share that data and collaborate on that data simultaneously. So I believe actually within SharePoint and within OneDrive, which I'll get to in a second, you can have up to 99 people in one document at the same time collaborating. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like because I, I really think that's where it makes it very powerful, especially when you're dealing with users who are remote, who are needing to collaborate and be productive and effective to get into documents and not have to save multiple versions of the document and see where the actual master document is, but actually how is it all right there. It's a very effective and powerful tool. 
Now, where SharePoint is really kind of more that collaborative side of, of the document repository application, OneDrive, I would say, is really more on the personal side. And this is really where each user, each business user, gets up to one terabyte of storage. And what's great is that both within SharePoint and OneDrive, they sync with your local device, and they also then push that up into the cloud. So if your device goes down, you can still access that data as long as it's been syncing back and forth from any device, essentially, with Internet access and a browser on it. But where SharePoint is more collaborative, OneDrive is really your personal document repository. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. But what's great as well within there is you can still share, you can still collaborate, um, but it really is meant to be used from a personal perspective for your, for your business files. And it's a, it's a great thing because Microsoft builds right within there one terabyte of storage. And last but not least, Microsoft's Skype. So you might have been aware a few years ago, Microsoft bought Skype. And so they used to call this application, it used to be Communicator, then it turned into Link, and, and now it's Skype. And it's more specifically Skype for business. And, and what really Skype is looking to do is provide you with that unified communications platform. So whether it's instant messaging, presence, web conferencing, video conferencing, now they've built in a cloud PBX and PSTN conferencing, all of that right within one solution. And just speaking from a personal perspective, we, we like to say we drink our own champagne or eat our own dog food here at CCB. And so we've been running Office 365 for quite a while now. And from a personal perspective, I knew that we would see a lot of benefits both from the Exchange and SharePoint side. But I think truthfully where it's transformed how we operate and communicate more than any other application as an organization is actually Skype. Um, I would say it's, it's enabled us even from a most basic level. I don't know about you, but I get inundated with emails every single day. And oftentimes, a number of these emails really were just a quick communication of, hey, are you going to be to this meeting on time? What's happening with this? Things that truthfully could have been handled more in an instant messaging type role. And even just from that perspective, it's helped me manage my emails more effectively, which sounds really simple, but it's actually had a huge effect overall um, on my day-to-day -day operations personally. Now, diving into this screen here, and the first thing I'll say is that when I was testing this beforehand, I can definitely say that um, this is a busy screen. So if it's hard to see, just let us know. We'd be happy to share this out at the end or even send it by an email. Um, but really what this just shows here are what the major additions are within the Office 365 solution stack or what they call their Office 365 plans. And you can see they have two primary platforms up on top. They have the business and the enterprise platform. So on the business side, the, the most basic way I can break it down is that this is really intended and meant for users that have 300 employees or 300 users or less, right? Now, there are some additional features and functionality built within the enterprise platform where we actually have a number of clients, especially if they have to adhere to some type of compliance. We deal with a number of organizations that are healthcare related, Sometimes they, they actually move, even though they're under 300 users, to more of an E3 type plan because it includes some of those additional features that add and, and will help them, I should say, meet their HIPAA compliance standards if they have to every single day. So beyond that, from the business and enterprise perspective, you can kind of see this is a mirror image. So business essentials is very similar to, to enterprise or E1, as they call it. There's just one additional feature there. Um, business is very similar to uh, Pro Plus. Business Premium um, is very similar to E3. There's not really anything from the E5 perspective as it, as it relates to the business, but not having to go through all of these, I'll take the enterprise platform and kind of break these down for you just so you know. So first off, really, because you're probably wondering, what are the main differences between all of these? It's such a busy screen. Kind of give me the nuts and bolts, right? So the main difference between the E1 and the E3 version really come down to a couple key features. And the first one is the E3 version actually includes Office Pro Plus. So this is the actual Office application that you can download to your local client. And actually, each user can download it to five devices. So each user in your organization can take that license and download it to five separate devices. With E1, you still get Office, but it's only going to be available via a browser, right? So you can access that through Chrome, Firefox, IE, Safari, but it's not going to be locally installed on your system, right? So the critical thing there is you need to be connected to the Internet. And it doesn't include all the applications that the Office Pro Plus includes, right? So if you need things like Access, um, it doesn't include that within the E1 version. What you would get from the basic browser Office Web Apps is what they used to call it, would be things like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote. Those real basic applications, which for many users is, is more than enough, right? 
And so you can see there the pricing difference, right, between those two, and, and that's one of the key features as to why, because the E3 includes Office Pro Plus, whereas the E1 doesn't. So you see it's $8 for a corporate user, $20 for a corporate user for E3, and then on the nonprofit pricing side, E1 is actually free, whereas E3 is actually $4.50. Now, a couple of those additional features, and this is where I was saying even some users might actually go to E3 even if they don't have 300 plus users, because it includes that additional compliance and information protection, DLP, e-discovery, so on and so forth, right? So it's another key distinguishing factor between E3 and E1. Now, a big difference between E3 and E5, because you can see the pricing there from the corporate perspective, and one thing where I can say this document isn't actually totally up to date is that about a week or so ago, maybe not even that long, Microsoft did actually come out with nonprofit pricing for E5. So when they did that, they actually moved the pricing from $35 for a corporate user down to $10 for a nonprofit user. And so really the biggest difference between the E3 and the E5 are going to be those things built within the PST conferencing and the cloud PBX. Now, it also includes some additional features, like the advanced security for your data. It includes things like uh, ADP, or advanced start protection, customer lockbox. It includes some things from an analytic perspective, more specifically within Dell, and then Equivio Analytics. Um, but really, where we're seeing a lot of interest from clients on is thinking, oh, I've got a legacy PBX, so and I'm a, I'm a nonprofit or I'm a corporate user, I can actually roll my entire PBX into the cloud. That's really cool, and especially if you're a nonprofit, for $10 per user per month, it's a really affordable price as compared to going out and, you know, I would say spending up front from a cost perspective, something around fifty dollars to $60,000 oftentimes is what we see for a small and medium-sized type business implementing a new VoIP solution. So that's, I know, a really quick overview, and I'm sure it's a lot to digest there, which, again, we're happy to send that out. But that's really the basic differences between those various varying platforms and then those varying plans built within there. Move on to the next slide here. So I'll jump off of that and jump into the demo here. So I'm going to close out Skype or Link, actually. And what I'm going to pull up here that you should be able to see now is Outlook 2016. And the reason why I like to start here with the demo is kind of twofold. So oftentimes when people hear the cloud and they hear Office 365, for them that's such an ambiguous term, they don't really know what it means. They're oftentimes confused and kind of wondering, well, what does that look like? And is there going to be a huge learning curve? And what's that going to cost to have someone come in and train my end user? So on and so forth, right? Well, one of the biggest things I like to show is really at the end of the day, you know, for a lot of users, email is the most critical application still. And if you're running Outlook 2016, Outlook 2013, even Outlook 2010, there's really not going to be a steep learning curve here for you. Now, with that being said, there are some great new features that Microsoft builds within Outlook 2016 that I want to show you. And again, this is the locally installed client that you can see here, if you weren't already aware of that. And this is available in that E3 or E5 plan. And something I didn't touch on in the pricing licensing guide there that, that I should have touched on earlier was just the fact that you can also buy just Office Pro Plus. So no email, no SharePoint, no Skype. You can buy that a la carte. You can also buy some of those additional, I would say, security and, and uh, uh, archiving features as well a la carte. For the most part, people are doing them within those plans or those additions, though. So again, kind of getting back to here, wanting to show you just a couple of the really cool features now built within Outlook 2016. One of the ones that, that I absolutely love that I think is, is really, really great is when you go to open a new email, oftentimes, and I'll pull it up over here, if you're going to attach a file, you would, you would often have to go and search for that file, right? Well, what Microsoft actually has done is, is they've taken that and they've made, it, they've made it intelligent. And so they know that oftentimes most people are attaching a file that they've recently worked on. And so what they do is they'll actually come in and they'll list the most recent files that you worked on, and they'll actually, from that standpoint, then let you pick right there so you don't have to go and search for it. Now, before I go and click on this, just one quick note is that oftentimes it's pulling these from your local device. So everything, for the most part, that you're going to see in here is going to be done in a demo tenant. But when I actually click on this, you're probably going to see some applications, actually, that I was actually using or some files that I was actually just looking at. So a PTO for one of my employees, more specifically an Office 365 document that I was just referencing before this webinar, 
uh, PTO for my entire team, HP pricing, uh, contract for one of our clients, so on and so forth, right? But these were documents that I was just looking into, just working on, and that's a great new feature that's just built within because for me, I'm actually attaching a lot of files to my emails, which I know my, my IT admin absolutely loves, um, but I, I do often do that. And so because of that, this has been a great feature built right within there that I can just very quickly find and sort that document, get that attached, and move on to the very next thing, right? The other cool thing that the Microsoft did, and they actually did this in 2013, but it's also available in 2016, is they built in these, I just call them Outlook apps more or less. And so what they did is they built in a couple cool features, and one of those is actually called action items. And so I don't know about you, but oftentimes I can get a lot of emails from whether it's the president of my organization, whether it's someone in my services team, and it's, it's rather lengthy or long. It's giving a lot of information. But for me, I'm just trying to figure out very quickly, what do I need to respond to? What are the things that I need to act on? And so if you go right here and you actually click on action items, it's actually going to go in and actually sort that email. And in sorting that email, it's going to tell you, hey, we think we found something that you need to respond to. And it basically, basically does that off of words, and it does that off of actions as well, or questions. And so right there, you can see it pulled it off of a question mark and then actually said, we think you need to respond to this. Now, another cool thing, actually, that's built right within Outlook now, and this is really great, actually, for a lot of people who are traveling a lot, they're in the field, um, they're, they're just really not in the office a whole lot, but maybe they're traveling and they're not necessarily familiar with an area, they get an email, such as this, in this example here, that actually includes an address. And what's really great that Microsoft builds right within Outlook is they have an integration with Bing Maps. And so if I go and click on this, it's going to read the email, and it's going to say, hey, we think we've actually found an address. And right there and then, you can see it gives me the location. I can drill down into that, and actually, if I have a general idea, say, oh, okay, I see where that is. I know exactly. If I just need to get directions, I can go right here and click on Get Directions, which are some really cool new features that they had built into 2013 that they kept in 2016. Now, something new that's in 2016 that you're going to see on the left right here is Groups. And really, this is meant to function almost as a dynamic distribution group. And, and I love this because I know a lot of times for, for us here internally, in order to do a distribution group, it's kind of a lengthy process. Usually only our admin does it. Um, and it's not always necessarily dynamic, right? Well, the great thing here is that Microsoft has built within Outlook 2016 this groups folder. And you can have a number of different groups within here, and they can be based around projects, they can be based around a client, it can be based around a specific user group within your organization or a department, but you can very dynamically create those right there and then within that groups folder. Within as well, something that I want to point out right here that you'll see, there's also this resellers folder. And this is specifically tied into a SharePoint page that I'm on and that I'm following that is Karen Berg, who's the demo tenant that I'm associated with, I'm actually linked to. And so all the emails, all the calendar invites, very similar to what's happening with this groups up here where you can start a Skype conversation, view the files, and use the calendar, all exists as well right within here, um, being tied back into SharePoint as well. So that integration is just absolutely wonderful. Now, the other, the other really cool thing that, that Microsoft is doing, and I think they're trying to do a lot around email management, to be quite honest, because they know that, truthfully, for most of us, we're just inundated every single day with email. So one of the things that they came out with recently, and that they had come out with it just around the time they were releasing 2016, is Clutter. And I know a lot of people, kind of like conversation do you have a love-hate relationship with Clutter? I absolutely love it. And, and the reason why is because, you know, oftentimes previously you had your inbox and you had your junk and you would move things to your junk. But there wasn't necessarily, unless you created a lot of rules, those in-between folders to say, well, I know this isn't necessarily critical or urgent, but I still need to get to it at some point. It shouldn't go into my junk. There are things that I need to be aware of, but I don't need to read it right away. It's not absolutely critical, right? So the really cool thing about Clutter is that it's also intelligent. So if you say, for example, I start moving all of Carlos's emails to Clutter, then what it will start to do is it'll say, okay, it's going to base it off of the conversation, and it'll say, is this conversation just the one that you care more to have in Clutter? But if it starts to see that I'm moving everything of Carlos in there, then it's going to say, no, this user actually now needs to go into Clutter. So it's really cool because it actually bases it off of the conversation, the topic, the user, so on and so forth. And it's, again, intelligent. And the really thing, nice thing I like as well is you can set it up to where it sends you an email at the end of each week to say, hey, we moved these files dynamically into Clutter for you, these specific emails. Do you want those in there? If you don't want those in there, we're obviously more than happy to move them out. You can manage that. But it's very nice because unless you're very organized and good with rules, 
this is a very nice quick way that I know at least for myself I get a lot of information from vendors like Microsoft and Apple and HP. Still things that I need to stay on top of, but maybe not necessarily critical. And so I have all of those going right into that clutter folder because it just dynamically reads those now and puts those in there. It also does that with other vendors just based on the email because it knows it's a vendor, which is really cool. I will say you've got to check it just because sometimes there are emails that go in there that shouldn't go in there, right? So it's something that you do have to keep your eye on. I'm checking my clutter multiple times a day just to see if anything critical is in there. But again, it's great because for the most part, it's enabled my true inbox then to only receive emails that are critical from my president, from a client, from a specific project going on, all that kind of stuff. Now, the other cool thing they started to do from an email management perspective, and then I'll move on from here, is they've, they've got this nice little tab up here called Cleanup. And Cleanup is a really great way for you to actually go in and clean up your inbox. And as you see here, you can clean it up by conversation, by folder, and by subfolders. So the thing that I really love about that is oftentimes when I'm away from the office, I'm actually going on vacation next week, I'm going to try my best to not look at my email. And so when I come back on the following Monday, I know I'm just going to have probably a thousand emails, right? But a lot of those will probably be responses back and forth. And so one of the things that you can do right when you get back into the office, and you can do this daily, you can do it weekly, whatever it is, I typically use it then when I come back from vacation. And I might say, you know, clean up this folder. And what it basically does is it takes all of the emails that's related to a specific conversation in that string, and you don't have to have it in conversation for it to do this, and it deletes all of the previous emails and only saves the most up-to-date one. Now, let's say that the conversation kind of gets broken off and there's actually two separate threads going on. It saves both of those. So it dynamically reads it, saves both of them, so you actually have both strings there. It doesn't just delete one and just save the other. So it's great from that standpoint because it usually gives me a huge sigh of relief that it drops it down from 1,000 emails somewhere down to 5,000 emails, right? So that being said, it's another great feature to just really try and help you stay on top of email management. Right? Another just quick thing that I'll say here is one nice thing that they built into 2013 that's in 2016 as well is, is the preview now. And so right down within here, you can very quickly actually drag your, your mouse on these and you can actually see based on what's going on, you know, what your calendar might be. You can see right here it's pulled up calendar, and it's actually going to go in here. Obviously, on the right, you can see I've got it listed there as well. But on the left here, if I didn't want that because I needed a more real estate to see my email, I could just very quickly go and drag my mouse right on there, and it's going to show me what my schedule is for the day. Now, one last quick thing that I want to show from a security standpoint, just as it's broken out through Outlook. So if you remember me saying earlier that within some of these additions, Microsoft has built in additional security features and functionality. One of those is, is really around DLP, or data loss prevention. And they do this whether it's by a PCI. So if you take credit card information, they do this off of HIPAA, again, SISMA, all that kind of stuff. And so let's take for an example that I'm an organization and I'm planning on sending this credit card information to someone internally here. So I've got this credit card information listed right here. And I'm breaking it out now. Typically, we say don't send any kind of credit card information and email as best as possible. But hey, this is what this user is doing at this point in time. So they're going to send it. And let's say, for example, they're typing really quickly and they have a personal email as well as a work email for this person. And let's say that they actually go ahead and they type in the personal email or just automatically populates up and they click the wrong one. I'm going to go in here and check names. And what oftentimes pops up actually is this nice little thing. It's called a policy tip. And you can change this policy tip, and you can also choose to enforce this policy tip. So if you, if you basically just set it as a notification, you can set it any which way you want. In this case, I just have it set as saying, please be aware you're sending what appears to be sensitive information to someone outside your organization. You could even set it to only a certain person in the organization can receive this kind of information. So even if you're sending it in the organization, it would say, this is someone actually inside your organization that's not approved to receive this. And so you could actually then say this as a notification and enforce it. So you could set it as a notification where the user gets this, but if they go and send it, then the admin also gets a copy just to be aware and they get a notification. Or you can enforce it to say, I'm sorry, this is not something that we believe you can send at this time to outside the organization or to the specific user, and it automatically enforces you for you there. Now in that situation, and this is oftentimes is the case, this wasn't anything malicious. This person just accidentally sent it to the wrong person, and that's often how data gets leaked or things get dropped. And so this is just another way that Microsoft is trying to build that into the overall ecosystem of their, their solution stack to help protect you as an organization. 
Now, just as a, a quick overview, this is what Outlook looks like for your end users if they don't have that fully installed Outlook client. And so what's great here is that in very, very many ways, this is going to be similar to what you see from that full client. You can see I have groups listed right here. I believe I might have this in conversation view, which you can do conversation view or not right within Outlook. You can see I've got a lot of this, uh, many features and functionality. I even have that action item app built right within here. And so a lot of the features and functionality built within the Outlook 2016 client is now also built into um, what used to be called OA, still in many ways called OA, um, but really just the Outlook browser version that Microsoft has listed there, which is great because for many of your users who they might not need that full feature set, this is still great for them because it's going to give them a very robust email solution. Now kind of switching from Outlook, I want to jump actually very quickly into Skype. And so this is one of those things, I think this is the only other thing in the actual demo tenant here that I actually like to use my own personal demo tenant. And the reason for that being is just because the, um, the demo tenant that Microsoft gives us um, is actually not, it's not great. And so I think I said earlier, demo tenant, this is actually my production uh, Skype for Business client that I use every day with CCB. So at its basic level, you can see that it's got instant messaging and presence. So you can see here, I've got Alicia. I went ahead and I clicked on her name and it shows that she's green. It also shows it right up in here as well. And so what that tells me and what that denotes actually is that she's available right now. And so you can see up here, if I actually move this over just a bit, that I could actually manually change that. Right now I have it at do not disturb because I'm doing a webinar and I don't want anyone to disturb me. I could manually go in and change that if I want to, right? And so it'll tell people if I'm available or if I'm not available. Now the great thing is, because if you're like me, I'm in meetings every single day, I don't really want to have to go in and manually change that. It integrates very, very nicely with your Outlook calendar. So with whatever calendar you're utilizing from an Outlook perspective, it integrates very well to where it automatically changes when you become available or when you go into a meeting. And it will also say, I'm in a meeting or I'm unavailable, whatever it might be. So it would change it in that instance from green to red, showing that at this point I'm, I'm busy or I'm in a meeting. But within here, so you can see I've got Alicia right there. It shows that she's green. It's got a nice little picture of her. I've got all, everybody within my organization as well listed within here, broken down just by varying uh, departments within the organization. The Aaron Bratchery as well, a nice thing I like to point out, um, he used to be our Microsoft rep, he's not anymore. But something that's great as well is as long as you're federated with an outside organization, you can actually Skype them. And so we actually have with a number of our clients here internally where we're federated with them and we can Skype with them back and forth. So while I think primarily this is utilized internally within an organization, it can be used externally as well. And we actually use it a fair amount for that. Now, built right within here, once I pulled up her name, there's a number of things that I can do. So obviously I can instant message her right here if I want to. If I actually want to go ahead and I want to do a video call, I can go in and I can do that. And it will actually give you a nice brief little picture to show you what that looks like. So you can see what your video is going to look like when you start doing that video call here. Now the other really great thing is you can actually go ahead and make a call. And again, if you remember me saying earlier, especially within the E5 edition, you're going to get PST and conferencing as well as a cloud PBX built right within, which is great. Now the other thing that I, I would say I love about this application actually is your ability to share your screen out. And so right here, I can actually present my desktop. I can present specific programs. I can, they know oftentimes people will be doing PowerPoint files with this. Um, there is actually more that you can do within here where you can whiteboard if you're talking collaboratively with someone. You can do this where you set it up as a formal meeting. You can also just do it on the fly. So again, all of those features and functionality are built right within the Skype client. It's not these additional things that you have to purchase and procure. You're going to get that instant messaging, that presence, which is basically showing you if someone's available or not. The web conferencing, video conferencing, cloud PBX, depending on what you get. And then also, of course, your, your ability to share your screen or specific programs, right? So I absolutely love it from that perspective because it's really a very nicely integrated UC solution that works very well with the rest of the Microsoft stack. Now, moving on from Skype for Business here, I'll close these down. And I'm going to show you what, what OneDrive looks like, and then I'm going to actually jump into uh, SharePoint as well. So what you see up here in this little Rubik's Cube is when I click on it, it gives me a number of applications that I can actually look at and reference. So you can see that I have Mail, which is what I was clicked on when I opened this browser. I've got my calendar. People actually is Skype. I don't know why they don't just call it Skype, but it's basically the same thing here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because I think I could be here for another 10 to 15 minutes talking about that. 
Um, but you can see here as well OneDrive and Site. So OneDrive, again, referring to that personal storage where each user within your organization gets one terabyte, and SharePoint referring more to that collaborative application. Still a document repository, but really its nature, in essence, is to be collaborative, right? So if I go ahead and click on OneDrive here, it's going to pull me into Karen Berg's OneDrive account. And this is where, again, if I have local files that I'm working on on my local device and I save them to my local device, but I have the sync set up to OneDrive, then those documents will be syncing back and forth. Same as if I was working on it within the web browser. So let's say I was working within OneNote Online or Word Online, make those changes. It's syncing those changes. So right up here, you see I've got a couple quick tabs. I can go in and I can actually create a brand new document. And I'll show you really quickly just what that looks like from a Word perspective so that you can see. It might take a second to load here just because I'm sharing this out. Um, but the reason why I want to show it to you is because it's a very rich application. It's not some kind of Word light or anything like that where you don't really have much features or functionality. It's very, very, very powerful. The same thing holds true for Excel. There are a couple feature things, feature sets and functionality sets that are in the Excel locally installed on-premise application that aren't in the online. But for most users, the online version is going to give you more than enough of, of what you actually need, right? So I can go right here and actually create a brand new document if I need to. And this is where I was referring to, even if you don't have that full version of Office, you could go right in here and you could actually create a brand new document and it saves it to your OneDrive. If I needed to upload a specific file or folder, I can do that as well. And if I just need to sync, if I'm syncing between my OneDrive that's stored locally on my device and with what's being pushed into the cloud here, I can do that and it will sync all of those changes that have recently been made. Now right within here, what's great within these ellipses is, you, is if you click on that, it's going to actually give you a bunch of varying tasks. And so I can choose to open it in OneNote Online, or if I had OneNote locally installed, I can do it there. I can also share this out. So if you remember me saying earlier, this really is meant to be used personally. It is. That's the primary intention. However, you still can share out specific folders or files within your OneDrive. And so right within here, I could go in and actually share this with someone specifically. So if I type in Alan, for example, Alan Steiner, VP of Corporate Marketing within the demo tenant, type him a personal message, I could then go in and click Share. And it would actually go in and it's going to send him an email with a hyperlink. And when he clicks on that hyperlink, all he's going to see is this. He sees nothing else in Karen's OneDrive. And the nice thing as well, you'll see that popped up here, and I'll pull it up in here so you can see it quickly, um, is that it will actually send you an email letting you know, hey, please be aware, you've shared this with Alan Steiner. So it sends you a copy of that. So again, if I click on this, because I'm in Karen's demo tenant, it's still going to show me everything. But if I was logged in as Alan, I would only see that specific file, nothing else. Another great thing is that right within here, they've got something called version history. So you can actually see the varying versions that are saved within here and who made the last changes, which is great because if you have a lot of documents going on at one point in time, it's a great thing to see within all of that. So it's really OneDrive at its basic level of what it looks like, right? Now getting into SharePoint. So if I go back up to the Rubik's Cube up here and I click on Sites, it's going to pull me into a couple different tabs here. I'll go to Home first just to kind of show you what SharePoint looks like because Microsoft did a great job of building out this demo tenant from a SharePoint perspective. And so really it's meant to be used as an intranet, right, an internal website for your employees. And so once it pulls up here, you're going to see it really doesn't just look like a shared file that people go in and access different folders and the specific files within there. It's very, I would say, has a very nice GUI, a very user interface. Now, it doesn't come like this. Uh, there are companies, I would say, that completely they have been build, built on nothing else but building out SharePoint sites and customizing them. So it's very, very difficult to do. It takes a lot of training. Um, it's something that we actually have partners that we work with who do this very, very well um, because it's not just building a nice-looking internet site where people can quickly find information that's pertinent to them, um, but it's also you can build with workflows within here. And so within this, and I think for sake of time, I don't really have it right now, but if I did, I'd show it to you. There's actually a workflow built within here where you can go in and actually submit a ticket to the IT team. So oftentimes people are using Spiceworks or Incentra, whatever it might be, as their ticketing system management. You can actually build a workflow within here where it takes that ticket, quantifies it by department, by what the issue is, and it sends that notification off. And if your help desk team is set up properly to receive those, which they would be, then you know it can determine it based on the priority, level one, level two. Really nice workflows that you can build within there. 
But again, by me saying all of that, you've probably deduced as well. Those are not easy things to build out. And so often, most people, I would say, are hiring companies to come in and do that for them. So this is a great site, though, because it gives you, I would say, a really good idea of the power that you can have in utilizing SharePoint to its fullest. So again, just as an overview, it's got a nice little outlay over here of the major departments within this organization, which is the fictitious name here is Contoso. It's got a featured blog, featured employee, product spotlight, what's going on at their cafe, so it must be a fairly large organization, what job openings are currently happening, what emergency procedures are. It's got at the basic level a calendar down here with popular documents that most employees reference. But let's say more specifically, Karen's come in and she needs to find a specific document that she knows a couple other people are already working on. So Karen's in sales and goes in and clicks on the sales and marketing folder. So she goes in and clicks on Collateral Center because that's where all the documents for the sales and marketing team at Contesto are stored. And then she comes over here and she clicks on Document Library. It's listed right here. You can see there's already a number of files listed right within here. But she goes in and actually clicks on Document Library. And then she goes into and she's looking for a specific campaign. And the campaign that she's looking for is the L270 campaign. So she clicks on this and it's got a couple different files listed right within there. So let's say she wants to go into this specific one here, which is the campaign messaging matrix, the L270 campaign. And she goes and she clicks on this, and it's going to pull up this document as an Excel online file. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit this workbook. Because again, right now I'm just viewing this. I'm not actually in there doing anything to edit it. And I can choose one of two things. I can choose to edit this in Excel, which is the full version of Excel, or I can choose to edit this in the browser, so what I'm currently doing and viewing it as. Now, a key thing I want to note is that if you want to have a collaborative time where you see people in the same document at the same time, you can't do it in the full version. You can download to the full version, make those changes, sync them back up here, and those are all going to show, but you're not going to be able to see people at the exact same time in that document if you're doing it on the locally installed Excel application. It's really only available in the browser version, right? As you can see here as well, I could also, just like I could in OneDrive, share this with specific people or groups if needed. So again, Karen wants to be collaborative with a couple of her users. She goes in and she chooses to edit this in a browser. Now the next thing that I'm pulling up here, you're going to see a side-by-side. -side. I have another user within this demo tenant. He's going to go in and ed choose to edit this in the browser as well. And once this pulls up here, what you're going to see right up at the top up here, so again, this is the CIE administrator. This is not Karen, but it actually tells me that Karen Berg is also in this document and editing it. And you can see over here in Karen, it also tells me, hey, just be aware you were the first person in, but now multiple people are in and editing this document. So let's say if I come over here and I click on this, you can see actually that it showed what, uh, what actual column or row the person is in actually editing. So if I just went in here and said test, please be aware. Is, and then, for example, that's what I have listed right now. That's listed right there. You can now see that that showed up on the other side. The great thing is, is it saves those changes dynamically, and it also saves who made those changes. So if multiple people are in that document, it could get a little crazy. And Microsoft has done a great job of saying, we want you to be collaborative, we want you to be productive, but we know you need to be organized as well. So if, for example, a change is made and that kind of messes up the whole document, well, again, those changes are made, versions are being saved, so you can go back and roll back to a previous version as needed. So again, just really kind of showing the power of SharePoint to be able to collaborate, and especially for those users that are in the field and that are remote, this is a very effective and powerful tool. Now kind of jumping out of here from a Karen Berg standpoint, I am going to jump very quickly into the admin console because I want to be conscious that I'm sure we have some people on this webinar today that you're, you would be responsible for managing your Office 365 tenant, right? So what I've pulled up now is the Office 365 tenant for the CIE admin. And one of the, I would say, tabs listed within here that's not listed in the general user tab or, or Office 365 tenant is this admin right down listed below. So if I go and I click on admin listed right within here, it's going to pull up a nice little dashboard. And it might take me to the brand new one Right now, yep, they're in a, Microsoft is in an admin center preview where they're actually coming in and they're changing the whole layout of everything that this looks like right now. So yeah, I figured it's probably going to have me confirm that, which is normal. It's got the new 
center that it's utilizing. So I'm just going to go ahead and click back in and actually go to the current one that most people that I know are actually using in the production environment right now. Because a lot of people, some people are utilizing the new one, which this is the new one, but I would say most people are still utilizing the old one. So I'm just going to click on go to the old admin center because it's still kind of in beta, getting rolled out. And this is what it looks like. And so if you can see there, it's a nice little dashboard and overview of your current Office 365 tenant. So it's going to tell you the health of your organization. And so obviously, as you see listed within here, green is great, right? So it does say, though, right next to it, service was restored, which makes me think, oh, interesting, something must have happened. So you can actually drill down into this, and it's going to tell you not just what happened, but what the measures and steps were taken to correct that. You can see that there's also an issue going on currently within this Exchange demo tenant. So it's talking about what's going on right now, where they're at in the stage, and when they expect to have this completed by, right? You've got a couple really nice quick shortcuts listed up here if you need to reset a user password, add a new user, assign licenses, all that kind of stuff built right within there. Now, listed right within here, if I click on users, I can very easily go into my active users and see who all of my users are that are currently active. And if I actually clicked on their names, it's also going to tell me what kind of Office 365 license they have, how many they have assigned. It can, add, it can actually enable me to do a couple of quick things here as well. So it's great from that feature and functionality perspective to manage your active users as well as your deleted users, which is listed right below. Now, another great thing, you can manage all of your domains listed right within Office 365 right here. In this instance, they only have one. Um, but you can manage a number of those domains pushing through your Office 365 as needed. One of the things that I think Microsoft did that was really great is they actually they know that the licensing overall just model was a huge headache. So managing that, making sure you were compliant, it was just really hard and difficult to do. So what's great about the Office 365 tenant is they've taken that and they've put all of that into the admin console. So you can very quickly see, like within this perspective, I have 25 total users. Since this is a trial, it would tell me on the next couple slides here when it's looking to expire. It tells me how many I have available and how many I have assigned, right? Now, if I want to look at the bill of what I've been paying on a monthly basis for these users, then I can go and I can actually sort by month. Again, this is a trial, so I'm not going to have anything there. But I can actually see what I've been paying on a monthly basis, which is great. It breaks it down very nice and clean right here about all the varying licenses that I have and all that I have assigned and if any have been expired. So if I have a new user starting and I know I need to assign them an E5 license and I see, okay, so I've got 25 total licenses, but let's say here it didn't say 25, it said 24, great, I've got another license that I can assign to them. If not, I know I've reached, I've reached my max and I need to go in and provision another license, which I can very easily and quickly do down in the Purchasing Services Center right here. You can also do this actually by procuring it directly through CCB by the CSP model, which is really the preferred method to go. Um, and it's something that you can definitely talk with your account manager about because in that instance, it doesn't really change anything for you. It just it basically allows us to do that for you on your behalf. I'll say it that way just for sake of time. Um, kind of going down here, just more specifically to focus on exchange. Because I know that for a number of people, when they think about a lot of what they're going to be managing from an admin perspective, they want to know what it looks like within Exchange. And so um, when it pulls up here, what you're going to see is that it's got it listed very nicely here to the left and then breaks it down a little bit more here in the center. And so it really does it very nicely because if I want to go into recipients here and I want to see the mailboxes that I have within my Exchange admin console, it's going to break down each of those mailboxes listed within here. It's also going to break that down based on per user mailbox, by the group, by the resource, so distribution center, conference rooms, all that kind of stuff listed right within here. I think from a bandwidth perspective, we're starting to slow down a little bit. So I won't stay there. I'll jump back into permissions or jump into permissions here. So this is great because you can assign those permissions, those roles based on if someone's an admin, if they're a regular user, if they're just using OA, and what that looks like, right? Now, compliance management, and this is really where you can buy it a la carte, but you really get to see, I would say, the power and utilization within the E3 and the E5 platforms. And this is really where you can utilize in-place e-discovery and hold. So if you're a legal organization, if you're HIPAA compliant, you have to keep documents for a certain number of years, and you have to be able to sort through them quickly. So you can have the archiving built right within. You can set that however you need it to be set. And then obviously you can have the e-discovery built right within, where if I need to find a document with the word, um, bunny in it, for example, uh, you can very quickly sort all the emails uh, that have the word bunny over the last seven years. 
from a DLP perspective, if you remember me showing you in the Outlook client where it's, it had that little policy tip pulled up because it was related to PCI with that credit card, this is where you can go in and set those. So from a day loss prevention perspective, I can manage the policy tips. You can see that with the credit card, I have it uh, testing with policy tips right now. I could choose to enforce it, which again, if I would have then tried to send it, it wouldn't have let that email with the credit card information go through. Uh, retention policies, which are just based on these retention tags, um, is really just, again, how long you want to keep that information for. So do you want to keep it for 30 days, for a year, for a month, whatever it might be, right? Now, the great thing as well is not just from, I would say, a compliance and uh, data perspective, but also from a security perspective, Microsoft's done a great job building in a number of things to help protect your environment, whether it includes a built-in exchange uh, malware, spam, outbound, inbound, so on and so forth. Those now are actually built into the Office 365 tenant. So in the past, if you were utilizing that, you were often buying that separate as Microsoft's forefront exchange solution. Um, that's now actually baked into Office 365, which is absolutely great. Um, advanced Threat as well, so again, if you have that E5 platform, this is really where you can go in and drill down a little bit more because we're actually seeing this a lot with a number of our clients where their end users are still clicking on attachments. And so within here, you can actually go in and define safe attachments. And if they don't have these qualities, then you can't open them. So for example, if it's not a PDF, then it wouldn't let you open it. If it's a Word, Excel, PowerPoint, however you want to set that, you can actually set that so that your users are only opening those safe attachments that you designate as being safe. You can come in here, and from a mobile device perspective, you can, I would say this basic level is a decent MDM solution, where you can manage those devices, you can set those rules, you can quarantine devices, you can wipe a device if you need to. Um, that, again, built all right within the Office 365 platform. Now, something that Microsoft did not have built in early on to the days of Office 365, but they very quickly added in was public folders. And this was because there was a very large outcry of clients who just said, we still use public folders very fairly heavily, and we know that we are eventually going to go to something like a SharePoint type solution, but we're not there yet. So we still need public folders. And so Microsoft, was probably about three years ago, built public folders into the Office 365 offering. So you can migrate those public folders, and we do it for clients every single day, just like you would a, a user's email inbox. So we're at about 3.22 here, and I think that we've had a number of questions actually already being answered. So I'm just going to see if there's any specific ones listed within here that I could answer. But truthfully, uh, Nick, who Nick is our sales engineer, our Office 365 resident expert, uh, he did a pretty phenomenal job answering uh, most of those questions. Um, one that I, I do want to answer very quickly, because I see it in the chat bar, actually, and I don't know if it got answered, is one from uh, David Walker. And he had actually just asked, how can you turn off clutter? And you could very uh, quickly and easily actually go into, I'll show you even really quickly up in here. We've got the time. So if we go back into the mail section up here, and hopefully my bandwidth at our Main Street location doesn't, stall on me here, but you can actually go right up into the person's identity or their account. Let's go right at the top right up here. You can see your nice little picture. I can go click right up in there. I can click about me. And then actually what I can go into, and it's going to pull up Dell, is I can actually go into and turn off clutter right within here. So this gives me a little bit more information about myself. But I can actually go in and then turn off clutter right within there. So you can do it right within um, the Office 360 tenant and each user, if they have the right to do it, can actually go in and turn it off right there if they need to as well. So another area where I think you can go in and actually do it as well is if you want to go in and even if we just click on mail specifically here, it's going to have an option here to do it. So a couple different places where you can come in and actually turn off uh, that Outlook. But yep, so right here and then there's clutter and then I can actually choose to uh, turn it off if I need to is basically what that looks like. So the, the last thing that I want to end with then, um, based on how things look like right now, is, uh, is just very quickly um, pull this up here. So I've got that, just so you've got my contact information. It's just that something that we know a lot of our clients um, are currently at the stage in is they want to move to Office 365, but they don't know how to. And we are, I would say, probably one of the premier organizations that can help 
at least sort that through for you. And Nick, who's been answering a lot of the questions today, is, is really our, our resident expert when it comes to Office 365. And we'll do a great job of really helping you sort through how to migrate, what to be aware of, what to take into account, what are those additional features and functionality that you need built in so that it's a seamless transition, so that your users are up and running the second that you finish that migration. We really do a phenomenal job helping clients get from an on-prem exchange, a POP3 uh, email system into Exchange Online and the overall Office 365 tenant. On top of that as well, we also do offer just a monthly managed service and support. So if if you're kind of wary of managing the Office 365 tenant, it is something that we can help you with as well on a month-to-month -month basis. We can do it on an hourly basis for you if you'd like, but we've tried to bring our pricing down so much, so especially for our nonprofit clients, um, so that it can be affordable to you and you don't have to worry about managing it from that perspective. Um, and within that as well, one of the cool things built within our monthly offering is a cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup solution. And this actually will take those backups as well. So if anything were to ever happen, you can actually very quickly sort through your emails as well as your OneDrive documentation so that you can go in and manage those right there and restore those if needed. So with that being said, I think we're going to end just a little early, but I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to attend today. I hope this was worthwhile. I'll kind of leave it open just a little bit longer in case there are any other questions coming through the Q&A or the chat window. But again, thank you all so much. I hope all of you have a great day.